Now, as a millennial and a student, I was not super accustomed to this idea of checking my mail, right? I didn't get real mail very often, but one day I had the idea that I needed to stop and check my mailbox and see if maybe my mom had sent me anything nice. Well, I get to the mailbox, I open it up, and it is just overflowing with mail. And I was so thrilled. I grabbed it all. I ran upstairs. I sat down at my uh, kitchen table there, and I began to open the mail. And it didn't take very long until I realized that this was not good mail. I opened it up to find out that I had opened up a credit card at Best Buy and maxed it out. Uh, I then found out that I had also opened up a credit card at the Piercing Pagoda. You know that little uh, jewelry kiosk in the mall? I had bought a lot of nice earrings for myself. I then got another letter from Macy's saying that I had been declined for a credit card. And I was kind of offended, like I am a Macy's guy. And then I got the best one of it all. Verizon had sent me a letter just congratulating me on the brand new family plan I had opened, the three new cell phones and screen protectors and AirPods, and they just could not wait to collect the $2,800 that I owed them. Well, you probably figured out by now, that wasn't me. Somebody had stolen my identity and was opening up all these credit cards and pretending to be me. And I, I, I was so frustrated because it took so much time to call all of those companies and try to convince them that, no, I did not want all of those earrings for myself. Or, no, I did not need all of those new pieces of technology from Best Buy. And I had to convince them, almost fight for myself, that I am who I say that I am. And maybe you've had your identity stolen or something with this over the years, and it's just so frustrating, and it feels like who you are has been taken from you. And I share with you that idea about having your identity stolen because it really connects to the third commandment that we're studying today. And if this is your first week with us at Trinity, what we've been doing the last many weeks is studying the book of Exodus and the story of Moses and him leading them out of slavery in Egypt across the Red Sea and into the wilderness. And they, we find ourselves at the base of Mount Sinai where God has created a new covenant with the nation of Israel through Moses. And he's offered them the Ten Commandments. And so for the next three weeks after today, we're going to work on studying two of these commandments every week. And so today we're to the third one. And in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, my Bible says this, you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. I'd also imagine a lot of folks maybe grew up hearing uh, the King James version of this particular commandment, the one that says, thou shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now, each of these translations, they offer us a little bit of a different idea about how to interpret this particular commandment. Now, I think a lot of us, when we hear this commandment, it immediately means that we're not going to cuss and we're not going to curse. We're not going to say words like, just kidding, gotcha. I'm not going to do that. This is church. But that's what this commandment says at a surface level, right? And I'll just say this. I'm your preacher. I'm your pastor. I got to say this. Don't cuss. There are so many better and more creative words out there. And especially don't do it in the presence of children and youth. Do a, set a good example for them, especially if you're at church or at a church function or in the community and they're going to know that you're a Christian and that they're, and you're somebody that they're to look up to. And I'm not going to stand on my soapbox the whole morning. That's all I'm going to say. Learn better words and don't cuss, especially around children and youth. But what I really want to do this morning is look past that surface level interpretation of this commandment, look back at the historical context of the time these commandments were given, and offer to you what I think this commandment really meant when God gave it to Moses in the Ten Commandments. And I think you'll find it has a lot deeper meaning than maybe what you've thought of before. 
You see, in the beginning of our story, when God revealed himself to Moses, he did it in the form of a burning bush, right? And he said, I am who I am. And we learned that God's name, which was Yahweh, it means a couple of different things. Three of the most popular translations of Yahweh could be something like, I am being itself. The idea of I am all being or perhaps everything that exists derives its existence from me. You see where I'm going with this? Or perhaps the best translation and the one I like the most is, I am the source and sustainer of everything. I'm the source and sustainer of everything. And all three of these definitions point to the same truth. God's name in the Hebrew Bible, which is Yahweh, makes a sweeping claim about who God is and then how we're meant to relate to God. You see, God's name in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, it appears over 6,000 times. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, Pastor Robert, the last couple of weeks, yeah, you've been saying the word Yahweh, or we've even sang it, sung it, sang it a few times in our worship songs. But whenever I read my Bible, when I'm trying to read the story of Exodus along with you, I don't see the name Yahweh very often. Well, it's because in our English translations of the Bible, most of the time Yahweh is replaced with the Lord. It's replaced with the Lord. You're probably familiar with seeing that in your Bible. And Uh, You might be wondering why, why don't we say Yahweh? Why do we say the Lord or God or something different for the name of the divine? Well, it really traces its history all the way back till the time of Jesus, somewhere uh, before or near the end of his life, a great concern developed amongst the people that a person might inadvertently break the third commandment by using God's name in the wrong way. Remember, Yahweh is a powerful name. And so rather than saying the name and perhaps risking breaking the third commandment, they just decided to substitute the word altogether. And that's where the Lord comes in. It's a little bit of a safer way. Instead of saying the all powerful 6,000 times in the Old Testament name of Yahweh, we say the Lord. And what that means, and I share that little historical detail with you, is because it means that God's name is incredibly powerful. Everyone and everything in all of eternity comes from God. And that's why the name matters so much. That's why it is the third commandment. And so now that I've offered to you a little bit of the history of the commandment, why God's name matters so much, I want to offer to you just a couple of practical ways that you could think about living out this commandment in your own life. So first application, very simple, kind of touched on it already. In your everyday language or when things happen to you, if you use the name of the divine, whether that's God, Jesus, Lord, Holy Spirit, and you add any other words to it afterwards, when you stub your toe, drop your coffee mug, run a red light, get frustrated at your coworker, miss your golf shot, a fish breaks off your hook, you break a nail, someone cuts you off, or you're just having a bad day, don't do that. Don't use the name of God when you are angry. Do not use it when you are mad at someone and never add extra words afterwards, especially if they're some of the more colorful words. And I know that might sound like vacation Bible school when you were in first grade and it's super simple, but it needs to be repeated again. There are higher expectations of us Christians. And I'm going to say that again in a few minutes. And so when somebody knows that you are a Christian or you go to church and you speak in the ways of the world, I'll just go that far and say that. And we don't align ourselves with the commandment. People judge the way we speak. And are we reflecting God in the way we speak? Don't use the name of the divine in a profane way. This type of language or this behavior, God does not approve of it. I would go as far as to say as God displeases of it. And I think this, again, is the most obvious application of the commandment. I hope to yourself, you're thinking, hey, yeah, I could work on that. I need to be better about that. But what I really want to offer to you about this third commandment is what I think is at the roots of it, the real core of this commandment and why God made this one number three. 
You see, most scholars that have studied uh, this time period say that the intent of this, pra- or of this commandment was that the practice of swearing oaths was very common in that time. Like we heard in the pre-sermon video, like you say, I swear to God. That means I'm really telling the truth or I'm making an oath. And people would do that on behalf of God. Like they were stealing the identity of God to prove that they were going to tell the truth. And God's saying, don't do that. This commandment for the ancient Israelites, and I would suggest to you this morning, for us as the church today, is about us keeping our promises and telling the truth. I wonder, can you think of a couple of times where you are required to tell the truth in our society today? I think about when you get that extremely lovely privilege of serving on a jury around your peers. And what do you have to do? You have to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Or I think about the presidential oath of office, right? Where they stand up and they take an oath. They promise to fulfill the duty of the office. And we're always reminded of where their right hand is as well. Another time you have to make a promise to someone is when you are getting married and you take a vow. You see, in our tradition, the Methodist church, what I say during weddings is this. I have the couple repeat after me, and I'm sure if you're married, this is similar to what you said. You say, in the name of God, I take you, fill in the name, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish as long as we both shall live. This is my solemn vow. Whenever I marry couples in the premarital counseling, I always remind them, and this is a good reminder for all of us, that this isn't just a vow that these two people are taking. It's not just about those two. They're making this vow. They're making this promise. They're telling the truth to one another in front of all the people that matter the most to them in the world. This is a public vow, but even more so than just between the couple or just between the congregation that is gathered for the wedding, they are making that promise to do that for one another before God. That's what this third commandment is about, is if you are going to make a vow to make a promise, you need to stick with it. The last way we can think about this particular commandment is thinking about how we represent God in the world. And our pre-sermon video talked about that a little bit. I've already mentioned it a little bit, but another way you could think about it is if asking yourself the question, how do I represent the love of Jesus Christ that I have in my heart in the world today? Outside of the four walls of this room, how are you representing Christ in the world? I'll ask it in a more pointed way. Could someone tell that you are a Christian by the way you speak, by the way you behave, and by the way you treat others? Maybe another way to think about it would be uh, you've ever been driving down the road, right? And uh, you get behind one of those cars that like is obsessed with going the speed limit. And on the back, normally it says, how's my driving? And you always have an answer for how their driving is. And it gives you a phone number. It gives you an email. I don't ever really want to know the person that actually calls that number, but you see what I'm saying. Imagine that you had one of those stickers on your back, right? And that everywhere you go, Somebody had the opportunity to call God and let God know how you are behaving and what you're saying and what you're acting like. And I know that that is not going to happen. And that's a little bit of a stretch there. But it's the idea that when you were out in the world and you are a Christian or people know that you go to church or that faith is important to you, uh, whether it's fair or not, people are going to judge you more sternly. All right. And I believe that's true for the vast majority of the world. And I think especially for those who have been hurt by the church or those who might have walked away from the faith for whatever reason, if they know that you are a Christian, you are someone who attends church and worships God, you might be the last thing left to connect them to God. And then if they're seeing the way you're acting, behaving, talking, treating others, spending your time, spending your money, Are they going to be more inclined to come back to the faith? Are they going to say, yeah, that's what I thought the whole time. Is that fair? I don't know. But it is the way that it is. 
And I think this third commandment reminds us of these three things we've talked about this morning. One, what is the language you're using? How are you speaking about God and how are you speaking for God? The second, are you keeping your promises? Are you doing what you said you would do? Another word for that is integrity and character, two words. And the last one is how are you living your life outside of this one hour on Sunday mornings? That's what this third commandment is about. And if you think to yourself, hey, you know, Pastor Robert, I'm a busy person. I've got a lot going on. I don't have time to make all these corrections in my life. I don't have time to make all these changes. I'm just doing the best that I can because I've got so much going on right now. I want to encourage you to really open your ears for this next commandment because it is written for you. The fourth commandment says this. This comes from Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. It says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blesses the Sabbath day and consecrates it. So simply put, the Sabbath day is about pausing from work, pausing from labor, perfect timing this weekend, and remembering all that God has done in your life and is doing today. This commandment gets its origins in the very beginning, the first story in all of scripture. Let's go back to Genesis 2. It says this, Genesis 2, 2, thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all of their multitude. On the sixth day, God finished the work and all that he had done, including creating you and me and all of humanity. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. So it's about pausing. It's about remembering all that God has done. But another thing we're going to take time to remember is all that Jesus has done on the cross. And that's what we're going to do in communion in just a couple of minutes. Listen to the liturgy I say this morning as we prepare to receive. I'm going to tell you that Jesus says, remember that this is my body and blood given for you for the forgiveness of sins. You see, the Sabbath is about pausing for work, remembering all that God has done, reflecting on what God is doing in your life today, where you think God is preparing to lead you next, and then thanking God for the love and the forgiveness and the mercy that he has for you. Let me ask you a couple questions about your life. You don't have to answer these out loud. You don't have to raise your hand, but just think about them for yourselves. Question one, do you ever feel overcommitted? Like there is no way you can get everything done. Do you feel like there are just not enough hours in the day? Have you lost your joy in the work you used to find joyful? Do you often think about quitting the things you do? Do you feel physically or emotionally exhausted? If you answered yes to one or more of those questions, you're probably experiencing or wrestling with this thing called burnout. And if you've never heard the term, I'm going to use the words of Brene Brown, a a wonderful uh, uh, counselor and therapist, and she explains a little bit more what burnout is like. She said, I once heard this quote from a priest. If you don't want to burn out, stop living like you're on fire. In today's world, we're surrounded by a culture of scarcity that tells us we're not doing enough, that we don't have enough, and that we are not enough. Whether you're a stay-at-home parent or a CEO, I have learned that I always have to be on watch for burnout because when it creeps up on me, I don't like the person I become. If we don't pause to take care of ourselves how can we ever hope to take care of someone else? If we're not stopping from work to pour into ourselves with a little bit of love and a little bit of kindness, how can we ever pour love and kindness out to those around us? And Sabbath helps us do those things. The Sabbath is God's plan. It is God's response to our relentless pursuit of hurry, of busy, of going, of doing, of hustling. And I believe that God knew we as humanity would need this commandment. 
and need to be reminded of it often. A couple of chapters later, God comes back to this particular commandment and says it in very stern terms. He says this in Exodus 31. He says, you shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work shall be cut off from among the people. Six days work shall be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest. Holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Now, that's really intense. And for several, just for a long time, critics of the faith, critics of the Ten Commandments would say, how can you worship a God that says if you have to do something on the Sabbath and you do it, you should be killed? I think that's a valid question. But I think it shows how much this commandment matters to God and how much it should matter to us as well. Adam Hamilton, the author of the book we're studying in this series, he wrote this. He says, I wonder if the death penalty in this text was a metaphor, a way of pointing out the impact of not resting. For example, if you're unwilling to stop and rest, your health will deteriorate. Your relationships will suffer, and in a thousand other ways, you will pay the price. If you die of a heart attack at age 55 because you never took the time to rest and reduce your stress, or you end up divorced because you never made time to rest or renew or to play with your family, was it worth it? Failing to observe the Sabbath, to keep it and to make it holy is a kind of death penalty for each of us. It looks like exhaustion coupled with the loss of joy, the loss of relationships, the loss of gratitude, and the things that are meant to enrich us and to give us joy. But if we don't stop, if we don't slow down, if we don't pause, if we don't remember at least one day for several hours a week, we will lose those things and we will pay the price. The Sabbath is meant to bring you joy. All right, so I'm going to be quiet now for 30 seconds, and I'm going to give you a pop quiz while I'm getting communion ready. What I want you to do is I want you to think of three things in your life that give you joy. All right, three things in your life that give you joy. You can make a mental list. I wouldn't encourage it. We often forget mental lists. So grab a piece of paper in front of you on the table or in the chair back, pull out your phone and text yourself or email yourself or message yourself three things that bring you joy. And next week, I want you to take a few hours of one day and do one of those things. The next week, I want you to pick the second one. And the third week, do the third one. I am challenging you to practice Sabbath and doing three things over the next three weeks that bring you joy, that give you life, that fill you up so that you can go and be a blessing to others.